Happy Friday, everybody. James Hancock here. Just got out of seeing the new movie, The Mule, directed by and starring Clint Eastwood. And I can safely say it is the best movie you'll see directed by an 88-year-old filmmaker all year, or perhaps in any year. Something tells me Clint Eastwood would not want to have this movie judged with a handicap and that he would prefer for the movie to be judged on its own merits because after a very long, successful, iconic career, he doesn't need our pity dollars. This is the second movie he's released as a director just in 2018 alone. It's his 40th movie as a director since 1971, and it's his 72nd movie as an actor in a career that dates back to 1955. He also picked up nine credits along the way writing scores for movies. So at this point, Clint Eastwood's filmography and his legacy are very much intact. And at this point, I really have no idea what's driving him, apart from the fact that he very clearly still loves telling stories and he still loves performing. Or maybe at this point, he's devoted so much of his life to his craft and his work, he honestly doesn't know what else to do with his time. Because while this movie might obey the rules of a traditional crime thriller, it's also got a very strong autobiographical streak in it as well. Because one of the main central themes of the movie is the cost of one's personal life when you place your career ahead of your family and your loved ones. Because in this movie, Clint Eastwood plays a character named Earl Stone. And while Earl Stone is not a celebrity like Clint Eastwood, for years he has enjoyed a certain degree of local celebrity and a lot of success as a horticulturist. He's always been on the road. He's made a complete mess of his relationship with his wife and his daughter. He missed his own daughter's wedding. As he admits frequently, he's been a complete total failure as both a father and as a husband. But now in 2018, the one thing that he's always put a lot of emphasis on his career is also in ruins. Due to failing to adapt to technology in the 21st century, he's lost his business, he's lost his home, his back is completely against the wall, which is why he falls into this incredibly lucrative career as a drug mule for a Mexican drug cartel. And Earl Stone's a fascinating character because mentally he's still very clear, but physically he's incredibly frail. Throughout the movie, in no way she performed as Clint Eastwood tried to hide his age. The character he's playing is actually 90. But a lot of this movie is just him on the road driving around singing songs. And you can see just the skin and the flesh hanging off of his arms. At one point, we see him with his shirt off and his pecs basically droop down to his belly button. And while he still enjoys dancing with pretty ladies, when he dances, he dances like a hunchback and just kind of waddles around. But he's got a career as a soldier. He's had a gun in his face in the past. So he goes into this situation with the Mexican drug cartel with both eyes open because he desperately needs money. Initially, he just needs the money to get his house back. But then he starts to realize that there are a lot of people in his inner circle who also need money. His granddaughter's trying to finish school and get married. One of his best friends has his restaurant burned down, where all of his fellow veterans like to hang out, so they need money for that. And soon he learns that his estranged ex-wife is basically at death's door and is in desperate need of medical assistance. So in his own good-natured, can-do way, Earl Stone just hurls himself into becoming the most successful mule working in the United States. Because he's very old, he's very calm, he's very careful, he's very polite. Wherever he goes, people love him, especially cops. But before long, he basically finds himself up to his ears and shit because the Mexican cartel that he works for run by Andy Garcia, who's absolutely incredible in this. There's a minor civil war brewing in their organization, and Earl Stone is absolutely caught in the middle. And to make things even more intense, he's got three DEA agents just breathing down his neck. You got Bradley Cooper, Michael Pena, and Lawrence Fishburne all teaming up, trying to bust him and take down the cartel. So I really had no idea what to expect from this movie going into it. As a Clint Eastwood fan, I've been a very poor one in the 21st century. I've skipped most of the movies that he's directed or starred in. While I love and adore a lot of his movies from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, for whatever reason, after Million Dollar Baby, I just no longer felt as compelled to see each and every movie, which is totally ridiculous because from a very young age on, both my dad and my stepdad, one of our favorite father-son bonding activities was to watch Clint Eastwood movies. It's a tradition my family still maintains. Only a few weeks ago, I sat down with three of my brothers and we watched The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly for the billionth time. But what's cool about The Mule is that it's a very gentle reminder that Clint Eastwood is still a master. Very simple, humorous, action-packed stories that are incredibly effectively told. I laughed pretty much throughout the movie, but the movie also has a genuine feeling of suspense and this lurking feeling of horrific violence or death lurking around every corner. And it also has heart to spare as Earl tries desperately to try to undo all the damage that he's done to his relationship with his wife and his daughter. Diane Weiss plays his wife and Allison Eastwood plays his daughter and they're both fantastic. But by far the best scenes in this movie are those where the character of Earl Stone, who has never really had a filter ever, but now at age 90 especially so, where we see him using language or figures of speech that many would find to be non-PC. But in spite of some of his more colorful language, we find him winning people over. 
that ordinarily might be offended. There's a scene where he bumps into this giant biker gang, and from a distance, they look like any other biker gang, but as he gets closer, there's one pair that's having trouble with one of their bikes, and he offers some unsolicited mechanical advice on how to fix things, and he refers to one of them as son, only to realize that it's a biker gang entirely, a very strong, very well-built lesbian women. They call themselves dykes on bikes. That said, he's incredibly polite and courteous with them, and they appreciate his input, and they end up fixing the bike. But the best scenes by far, those where Earl Stone is bonding with some pretty hardcore, ruthless criminals in this Mexican drug cartel. These guys are enormous. They have huge muscles. They got tattoos. They're armed to the teeth. And they're totally bewildered by this old guy who can barely use a cell phone. He doesn't know how to text. On his first drug run, they try to install a hidden compartment on his truck. He's like, no, I just throw it in the back by the golf clubs. They'll be fine. He's basically a unicorn as far as they're concerned. However, over time, as he proves himself incredibly reliable and incredibly useful and he starts making them piles of money, they do form a rapport. And they even take him to Andy Garcia's house for one of the craziest parties that I've seen on film in a very long time. And a lot of his handlers who are assigned to him try to push him around a bit. A lot of them openly despise him, but there's this one beautiful scene where even though Earl has no idea that his truck has been bugged, he's singing songs on the radio as he's driving along, and the car following him is listening, but as it turns out, they've got similar taste in music, and so in both cars, they're all singing along. It was absolutely beautiful stuff. So as crazy as it sounds, at age 88, Clint Eastwood has not lost a step as a storyteller and as a performer. He obviously still loves what he does. He also obviously feels an enormous amount of remorse for the trail of wreckage he's left behind him with all of his various girlfriends and wives and children. And I know a lot of people out there won't go see Clint Eastwood's movies because they disagree with him politically, but to anyone who's kind of shadow banned his movies because of that, I would simply say, go see the movie and I think you'll be delightfully surprised by just how much nuance and shades of gray there are in this flick. And at age 42, when I look at an 88-year-old filmmaker who's still as busy and active as he is, I find his career overall to be incredibly inspiring. But for those people out there who are much younger than I am, who might be half my age, who perhaps didn't grow up watching Clint Eastwood movies, I just want to close this review with a few suggestions of movies that that both feature Clint Eastwood as an actor, as well as those that he directed. When it comes to his movies as a performer, you really can't go wrong with the movies directed by Sergio Leone or the movies directed by Don Siegel. Those are two of his most frequent collaborators as he was trying to learn to become a filmmaker himself, and even dedicated his movie Unforgiven to those two filmmakers. So start with Dirty Harry and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and branch out from there. You really can't go wrong. Also, if you want to hear some very lengthy podcasts on this particular topic of Clint Eastwood and his movies, we've done a bunch of episodes of my podcast, Wrong Real, where we tackle his relationship with Sandra Locke and all the movies they made together, who R.I.P. died yesterday. We tackled the Dirty Harry franchise. We tackled all the movies that he worked on with Don Siegel. So I'll leave a link in the show notes below to Wrong Real, but just go to Wrong Real and do a search on Clint Eastwood, and you'll see all those episodes come up. But in terms of movies that Clint Eastwood has directed that I would recommend, I've got IMDb open right in front of me, and I'm just going to go up the list of my particular favorites. Play Misty for me brilliant thriller. Holds up really well to this day. It's a really sexy thriller with a lot of great jazz music in it. High Plains Drifter, absolutely ruthless western. I think a lot of people will be shocked and amazed by just how savage it is. I've got a lot of love and affection for the Iger Sanction, but the outlaw Josie Wales is one of the best westerns ever made. If you want to see a brilliant western directed by Clint Eastwood, where he's still young and in his prime, start with the outlaw Josie Wales. But The Gauntlet, that's a great one with Sandra Locke. Bronco Billy's a great one with Sandra Locke. Sudden Impact is a very solid entry in the Dirty Harry franchise that Clint Eastwood directed. But it's in the 90s where we see him starting to switch gears and basically accepting the aging process gracefully. Unforgiven, which came out in 1990, 28 years ago, when Clint Eastwood was considerably younger than he is in The Mule. Nonetheless, it's a great movie about an aging outlaw and gunfighter. And in the 21st century, I think Mystic River is probably the strongest movie that he's directed. Directed. It's got an extraordinary cast and a subject that sadly is still very topical to this day. And I'm ashamed to admit that I've skipped so many movies that he's directed past that. I never saw The 1517 of Paris. I never saw Sully. I never saw Jersey Boys. I don't know if I'm necessarily going to rush out and see those, but obviously American Sniper was a huge hit. Gran Torino will probably be featured in memes and gifs where he's saying, get off my lawn until the end of time. But for me as a fan of movies, I just love seeing the filmmakers that I've liked from a whole life proving they still got it. Like when director Paul Verhoeven made the film L two years ago, it was one of the strongest movies of his career, and Paul Verhoeven's in his 70s. Or when George Miller absolutely blew everyone's minds with Mad Max Fury Road, arguably the best action science fiction movie of the 21st century, he was also 70. Or seeing Alejandro Jodorowsky, a pretty obscure art house figure and comic writer, basically becoming a 21st century celebrity in his 80s. It just shows that as long as you remain passionate and in love with the craft of filmmaking, you can continue to generate great work. At any rate, I think I've rambled enough at this point, so I'm going to wrap this video up. If you enjoyed this review, please consider subscribing to my channel. I would really appreciate it. You can find me on Twitter at Colbrax if you want to talk about Clint Eastwood movies. And I'll be back at you in the very near future with some more reviews. But can't thank you enough for watching my channel. I really appreciate it. But more importantly, onwards and upwards.